Welcome fellow alumni. I'm Donna McPhee. I graduated from Columbia College in 1989 and I'm currently the president of the Columbia Alumni Association and I'm so glad you've joined us today. I want to give a special welcome to our younger viewers. Um, you are certainly in for a special treat today and I hope when it comes to the Q&A that you will be even submitting more question than, questions than your parents. And don't forget to submit your names and your ages when you do. Um, we're joined by Johnny Kingslake, who will be speaking about the Antarctic ice sheet. Professor Kingslake is a glaciologist and an assistant professor at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory at Columbia University. His research focuses on the flow of ice and water in ice sheets. Johnny has conducted fieldwork in Norway, Alaska, Greenland, and Antarctica, and uses a combination of mathematical models, satellite data, and field observations to examine fascinating and important processes that control how the ice sheets will respond to climate change. Um, I'm sure we'll be asking questions of Johnny about his trips to Antarctica, um, so uh, look forward to that. Near the end of the program, when we have our audience Q&A, you can use the feature at the bottom of your screen to submit a question. We'll try to get to as many as we can in the time that we have. I'm now pleased to welcome Johnny Kingslake to Columbia at Home. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in uh, this afternoon, this evening. So I can tell you something about our research and something about our, my trips to Antarctica. So let me share my screen with you all. There we go. Okay, like Donna said, thanks so much everyone. Thanks so much to the Alumni Association for hosting me here as well. Give me the chance to speak to so many people. There's nearly 200 people on the call right now, so this is incredible. So like Donna said, I'm gonna talk about my research in Antarctica. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna talk about how the ice sheet has changed in the past and how it's changing now and how we are trying to help people work out how it's gonna change in the future. Now, yeah, as Donna said, please think about questions about the actual trip, about what it's like to go to Antarctica, but also about the science. And if I go too fast, I will can definitely come back and explain anything again in more detail. Right, so this is Antarctica here, this picture on the left here. And uh, this is what it looks like if you were up there in space, looking at it with your naked eye. It's all white with some rocky mountains here. Now on the right, here's this other map, which is, a, which is actually, uh, the colors show something about how the ice actually moves, actually flows. So that's gonna be a key takeaway, especially for the younger listeners here. The idea that is a, you know, a crazy revelation, an amazing thing, is that ice actually flows like a liquid, like a fluid, like some kind of syrup. Now I'll get back to that and explain to you more about that later. Okay, so first a little bit of background about me. So I've, you might hear from my accent, I'm from the UK. Here's a map of the UK on the right hand side. And I did an undergraduate degree. So the, 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 the stage of education after high school in the UK, we did, I did uh, an undergraduate degree in physics. And I always recommend to people to be, um, if they wanna get into doing something exciting, something in earth sciences even, which is what I ended up doing. Starting out in physics is a really great way of doing it because it gives you a really good background in maths and um, how the world works. Okay, so then I went on to do a PhD. This is the next stage, that's when you become a doctor in mathematical glaciology. So glaciology being the study of ice uh, in the natural world, like ice sheets and glaciers. And that was in Sheffield, still in the north, north of England up here. And then I was a, for a while I was a glacier geophysicist and uh, at the, at the British Antarctic Survey, which is the British government's um, agency, which does science and um, logistics in Antarctica. And that's, that was down in Cambridge, the same town with the famous university in it. So then four and a half years ago, I um, applied for and got a job here as an, at Columbia University as an assistant professor. Okay, so that's something a little bit about me. Let's start talking about Antarctica. Well, here we are, here's our planet, and here's the Northern Hemisphere. Here's where I used to live, here's North America, and here's the US. And this star is showing where I am now in, in New York State. And 
you know you may all be anywhere anywhere in the world for all i know which is the amazing thing about these remote meetings but here we are in the northern hemisphere but i'm going to rotate the globe round and we're going to look at the southern hemisphere here and now here sitting over the south pole is uh, this big white splodge on the bottom of the planet and what what that is is a, it's an ice sheet so it's it's a place where like it like in other parts of the world it snows in the winter snows when it's cold but it never gets warm enough for all that snow to melt away and of course what do you if that were the case anywhere if it never gets warm enough to melt away the snow what happens well the snow just builds up and up and up and up and becomes hundreds or thousands of meters thick thousands of feet thick and not only does it stay as snow actually the snow actually squashes itself down under its own weight and becomes solid ice just as solid as the ice you'd get in your freezer, in your ice cube tray in your freezer. Okay, so why do we care so much about these things? Well, they're so large, they're such a, a large volume of ice, that at any one time, they actually store a significant amount of the world's water. And so if those ice sheets, like Antarctica, grow or shrink, well, then the sea level goes down or, or, or goes up because some of that water, which is in the ice sheet, goes into the ocean. And that's actually what's going on right now. The ocean is actually getting deeper. It's getting, sea level is going up. And here's one of two figures, two plots, which I'm going to have in this presentation. So bear with me here. So along the horizontal here, along this axis is time, going from the early 1990s up through to 2017. And then here is uh, along the vertical is globally averaged sea level change. So if you average across the surface of the ocean across the whole planet and saw how, the, how high that water was on average um, and saw how that changed over time, this is what you've got here. And you've got a few wiggly lines because the data is all, you know, it's quite, things change in a wiggly way over time. But this black line is a, is a statistically, the statistical curve which they fitted to that to try and show what's going on. Now, one thing you'll notice is sea level has gone up over time. Over here is down 20 millimeters, and then over on the right-hand side, it's gone up to 80. So over this time, it's gone up 60 or more millimeters. Now, the interesting thing is that that's actually getting faster. If, if anyone's got keen eyes, they can see that this, this curve over here is actually a little bit shallower than it is over here. So that means the sea level is going up, and it's going up faster than it was in the past. And most of that speed up, that acceleration, is because of the ice sheet suddenly starting to play a role in sea level, because the ice sheets themselves are actually shrinking. Okay, now here's our second graph. Second graph out of two, so don't worry too much. So here we've still got time going along the horizontal from 1990 through to pretty much the present day. This time, this is showing what's going on in the ice sheets, and these are curves that all show what's going on in the ice sheet or in fact, just Antarctica, the one I showed you at the beginning. So this, let's focus just on this purple patch here. What, you're, what you'll notice is that it's the same deal. It basically started out with zero change. It started out pretty much steady. It wasn't changing much. And then over time, over the decades, or over the, this kind of short period, it started to, this curve has started to come down. And what that actually shows is how much mass, how, how many tons of ice have been lost. And then on the right hand side, you can actually see that that corresponds to sea level changes. So if you lose thousands and thousands of tons of ice and then spread all that water, which you get from the ice across the whole planet, across all of the oceans, you get this amount of um, sea level change. And now, okay, so the thing is, people, this is all kind of interesting, but these numbers are pretty small. They're making a small difference. There's only like a few millimeters of change over this time. But the real concern is that people have is that over time, this will actually get faster and faster. And that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to predict how this is going to change going off the right hand side of this graph off into the future. Okay. Next one. Okay, but the thing is, predicting how ice sheets will change is really difficult, to put it in a simplistic way. What we want to do is somehow work out, look at how the world works now, and then run a computer simulation, to, which is going to tell us how the world is going to look 
in 50 years or 100 or 1,000 years time. Now, why do we want to do that? Actually, you should cover that too, right? We want to be able to predict this so we can plan. So if they want, if they want to decide how high to build their sea defenses around Manhattan at the mouth of the Hudson, say, in, the New, York, in New York Harbor, it would be really great if we knew how high the sea level was going to be in the future. But it's really difficult. And now back to this slide. Predicting how ice sheets will change is really difficult. And simplistically, why? It's because they're really big and they're really complicated. Well, on, this, on the right-hand side, we have the contiguous US. So this is California, and then this is New York State, overlaid on Antarctica, just to show you how enormous Antarctica is. Uh, and why? And that makes it difficult because it makes it difficult to make observations. You can't do experiments, for example. You, you have this huge system which you can't fit inside a laboratory. You have to go there and take really detailed but very large scale uh, measurements. And that makes things difficult. The other reason is because these ice sheets are very complicated. And this plot here on the right, you're not going to be able to see all the details of this. But the point is, there's lots of arrows pointing from the sun, from the from the ocean, from the ground underneath the ice sheet, and from the clouds, and from the out ice sheet outwards. And these arrows are indicating all the different complicated processes going on. Let's just pick one. Okay, so here on the right hand side, you have this, this red line, that's heat coming in from the ocean. And as you can imagine, there's this complicated thing where there's this warm water is traveling in underneath the ice. It's, it's actually moving around, transferring some of its warm heat, warm, um, some of its warmth into the ice and removing some of the ice that way. That's incredibly complicated. There are thousands of people in the world working on just this arrow here. And the same is true for all these other ones. So they're really complicated and, and they're really big. Now, saying they're really big is it's not really sufficient, right? So the ice is 2.5 miles thick in the middle, in the middle of East Antarctica here. That's not really sufficient because it's really impossible to understand what two and a half miles thick actually means. So what I've done here, this is a um, famous landmark in New York City called the Empire State Building. And uh, what I've done is put this green block and it has the same footprint as a city block. Like, like th in this direction, it's like a city block, but vertically it's two and a half miles high. So I'm gonna zoom out and that's gonna give you hopefully a little bit of a better idea of what two and a half miles actually looks like in practice. So now we're gradually seeing the New York Harbor I was just talking about. Here's the, um, the East River, here's Midtown and Central Park. And we're still growing and this is, this is two and a half miles high. So this is what it would look like if there was an East Antarctic ice sheet laid over the top of New York City. Okay, so they're huge and complicated. Let's, we've established that. The other thing I wanted to make sure everyone comes away from this with is the knowledge about ice flowing. So the weird, the crazy thing is, so if you got a piece of ice out of the, out of the freezer and hit it with a hammer, it would shatter into a thousand bits. It would, it would break, it would break what we call brittily. It would like little fractures would happen and it would break. But when you get ice in one place or sorry, much, a huge amount of ice in one place, thousands of meters uh, worth of ice in one place actually starts flowing like a fluid. And now I'm going to show you this, this data I was talking about right at the beginning. So now, Here's data, this data from, from NASA. And all these colors mean, uh, these colors indicate how fast the ice is moving. And these blue lines indicate the direction it, in which it's moving. So what you see is where, uh, in general, ice is falling as, as snow in the middle of the ice sheet, and then it's following these blue lines outwards in every direction out towards the ocean. Okay, that's the first thing you'll notice is it's flowing out towards the ocean. Then you'll also notice that um, it's almost like a river system. All these tiny, tiny bits of ice all join together into these really uh, concentrated flows of ice, which we call ice streams. And the other interesting thing is that it starts out very, very slow in the middle. So this oranges, that means the ice is going maybe one meter per year. So really not far at all. And then the purples mean it's going more like a thousand meters a year. So on the way out towards the edges, it's flowing and it's speeding up, it's getting, you know, starting off at one meter a year and it's getting faster and faster and faster and stretching and stretching and flowing out to the ocean where it becomes, um, uh, where it becomes icebergs and then those icebergs melt. All right, so where does all my work fit into all this? Well, I visited this area of the ice sheet 
to understand how the ice flowed in the past. We're interested in over the last 10,000 years, how has that pattern of ice flow, which I was showing, how has that changed? So you might ask, well, why do we want to know about that? Because we want to predict the future. And actually what people have been have recognized for a long time is actually, well, for one thing, Ant Antarctica flowed very differently in the past because the climate was different. It was actually cooler. Um, 20,000 years ago, the, the climate was actually a lot cooler than it is today. And the ice sheet was actually a lot bigger. And then from that time, it, when it was very big, it's, it's shrunk down to its current size. And what people have realized is also is that you can actually use this to help us predict the future. Because if we know very, very well how the ice sheet changed from being big in the past to its current size, we can actually test out those computer models I was talking about, which are designed to predict the future. We can test them out on the past. And ideally, in the simplistic way, if we can very realistically reconstruct the past, that gives us more confidence in using those same computer models to predict, predict the future. Okay, so um, let's get a bit more specific about why I was going to this spot and what interesting stuff we found. So this is a picture of that area I went to and these blue, this little blue patch here, uh, the edge of the blue is the edge of the ice sheet. That's what we think that's what we used to think the ice sheet was doing at 20,000 years ago. Then 15,000 years ago, it got a little bit smaller. Did you see it shrinking in? Then 10,000 years ago, it got a little bit smaller still. And then 5,000 years ago, it got smaller. And then eventually it got to its current size. So there was this like progression marching in over time and then reaching its current size. So we're going to go test that idea. So now let's get into our field work, which is probably the most exciting part. So, we spent th two, we did two trips where we spent three months each time um, traveling around on the surface of the ice. And this is me sat on one of these snow machines, which we used to travel around. And I was with one other person for that full, for the, for the full time I was there. And that's the, that's the guy taking the photo. So it was just the two of us. And we spent months in this tent um, on two trips. So we've got all in this picture, we have everything we had with us. We've got, camping equipment, first aid equipment, fuel. Um, and then here's a, and then that sled there has got a, a load of science equipment on it. And then here's some more field equipment. And out, and out the back of the sled here is our ice radar. That was one of the main things we were there to do. It was to use radar to look into the ice beneath us. Let me, I'll explain that a little bit, a little bit more in a minute. But I've put together this little video of our trip to give you an idea about what we were to give you an idea of what we were what we were up to. So we flew in in these small planes, these things called twin otters, and we um, landed on on the surface of the ice. And then, uh, yeah, this is us landing in bit and, and putting us in place here. What you'll notice in this video is there is almost no scenery. There's no mountains except for when we were flying in. There's no valleys, there's nothing. Where we were was, to the naked eye, it was completely flat. And that's one of the most remarkable things about Antarctica is that when you're there, it's, the vast majority of it is completely flat and all you have is snow and sky. And sometimes the sky's got clouds in and sometimes it doesn't. And that's pretty much the only distinction you have. So all these, a lot of these videos are of the clouds <laughs> it's because it's not that much else to video um, but luckily I was with this really amazing photographer who was taking these time-lapse photos where you take thousands or hundreds of photos and then um, speed the, vid the video up when you get back and that means we can get these great um, fast sped up videos of us doing work and putting the tents up and taking them down so here we are using one of our radar systems we had with us which actually in this case involved us sitting around not doing very much and, and then, as you'll see in a minute, we did get some stunning cloud scenery. If that's, if that's what you're into, it was, quite, it was quite beautiful. So while we're watching this, I'll also explain this idea of what a radar is doing in Antarctica. Well, 
If you've ever been to an airport, you see the you see the uh, control tower spinning around. What's that doing? Is sending pulses of radio waves out into the out through the atmosphere, and it's bouncing off planes, and it's coming back. And they and they use that to work out where the aircraft are, how far away they are. So what we were doing was actually oh sorry, this was Christmas Day, 2013. <laughs> I wanted to make sure I point that out. What we're using this radar to do is to ping out radio waves, but downwards into the ice and then listen back for the echo, which you get when the radio wave bounces off the bottom of the ice and comes back to where we are. And if we know how fast the radio waves go, we can work out how thick the ice is. But that was the first thing we wanted to do is work out how thick the ice was. And then the second thing is to actually look at all the internal structure of the ice. You see all this in detailed internal structure. So I'm going to skip straight to that right now. So this is the route we did across the area, so that's not too important. But what I wanted to show you is this. This is what you get from these radar systems. We, we, we drag them around and we get these pictures. It's as if you took the ice sheet and chopped through it like a loaf of bread and looked at it from the side. And um, what you'll see on the right-hand side is that you have like this, 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 these numbers are the depth now inside the ice. So this ice is actually 700 meters thick, which is incredibly thick. Now I'm going to point out, I'm going to show you some more cool structures within the ice, but in a minute, but for now, just check out these, these, these things, which look almost like a barcode, these black and white stripes. And these are things which contain a lot of information about how the ice has flowed in the past, which I won't have time to explain properly. Okay, we're just finishing up pretty soon, but then we can get onto the questions. But I did want to show you this, this way of looking at the data, which, which I find really, really interesting. So if people have ever had an MRI scan or ever seen pictures of these things, it's like having slices of, 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 an, of an image through a person, through a person's brain or something. So this is almost what we're looking at here. It's like having an M MRI scan through the ice. So we're imagining ourselves floating in the, in the ice, looking at uh, these MRI scan things. So this, is, this stuff at the bottom is the base of the ice. This thing you can't really see very well is the top of the ice, but these are these slices through. And what I'm gonna do is take and show you that you can, there's actually multiple slices. And as you reveal them, as you remove them, it, they reveal the, the slice behind them. And what you'll notice is that there are these, these undulating structures, which I pointed out before, but there's these other things which are a real surprise to us. These bright, um, these bright features, which are all tilted over and stacked on top of each other. And we really did not expect to see these at all. No, I don't think anyone has seen anything quite like this. So we came back in our second year, having seen a glimpse of these things. And we said, okay, well, we need to go and investigate this more. And so we did a whole survey, driving up and down, driving up and down, just on this area. And, I got, and we got all this data, which I'm showing you now. Now, years of thinking about it and analyzing the, the work and working with researchers in Germany and in uh, Northern Illinois University, we eventually collated all that data together and decided what the, best, the, the best way in which our data could be explained was if Antarctica was actually smaller a few thousand years ago than it is today. So you know how I was saying Antarctica shrank like from 20,000 years, 15, 10, five, and then it reached its current size. Well, actually what, that, what we actually have shown and we wrote a paper about this is that at some point in that time, Antarctica was actually smaller than it is today and then it regrew. Now we can get into the, all the interesting reasons about why that could have been, but we won't really have time right now. But that was just one of the ways in which we, in fact, we just made it more complicated. We just made the whole system more complicated. We pointed out to everyone that, look, this, this ice sheet can also do this. And so that's really the time to sum up and then we can get into more detail um, in the questions if anyone's interested. But let's, just to reiterate, predicting the ice sheets is what we're trying to do, but it's really difficult because they're really big. And they're really complicated. And we, in fact, we, in some ways, we make things a little bit more complicated. But eventually, 
that in more knowledge of how the ice sheet can change will translate into better computer models and better predictions of the future. And we're all working on how to do that and work with other collaborators around the world to do that right now. So thanks very much. And I think it's probably time to go on to some questions. I'm happy to answer any question at any, any level. Thank you so much, Johnny. That was certainly interesting fascinating and I was especially interested in seeing living on Antarctica um, and it must be com amazing to not have any height within mountains or valleys and um, so some of the questions are coming in on that front so we're going to start with um, one of the questions is was there any running water in your base? And what did you do yeah. for food and drinks? Certainly there were some drinks on Christmas and food. <laughs> yeah. Share a little bit more on that front. It's a great question. So we were totally, we were almost completely autonomous during that two months. So two months we were actually out and um, we carried all our fuel with us and, and all our, almost all our few food. We actually had depots laid out for us so we could travel to an area and there'd be some food there. So what we did for water was to melt snow. The snow is very clean. And so you actually dig, you go off to an area which you designated in your camp as a clean area. And you don't walk over that area. You just go there and dig up snow, bring it back to the tent and melt it. And then you get really fresh, clean water. Um, uh, so food wise, you, would, you, you can't have anything which can't be frozen. So fruit, no fresh vegetables or fresh fruit. We did have some meats, which can just be frozen, um, but anything which which is not going to want to be frozen, we couldn't we couldn't have. And so that ended up in practice being dried food. So if anyone's ever been camping, you get those pouches of dried food, which you pour water into and they rehydrate. And we had six of six different flavors of that, which we just rotated around. So as you can imagine, I mean, yeah, the food really was not. It was something just to try and not think about too much. It really was not an exciting part of the trip. <laughs> it, it, you, you sacrifice uh, flavor and, and variety for simplicity and, and lightweightness. Well, and thanks to Logan in California, who's seven, who asked that question. And uh, if ever goes on a trip to Antarctica, we'll probably have to think carefully about what he would want to pack. Um, so we had a question about I know that water will always find its level if you are talking about a bathtub, but does the water always get to the same level on a global scale? Wow. What, could, what could impact that besides gravity? Well, that's a great question. It's a great question. Well, let's even let's just deal with gravity first. That's even an interesting one. Before we get onto non-gravitational effects, things which are affecting it beyond gravity, even just within gravity, there's some really cool effects. So, the gravity field in the earth is not uniform everywhere. It's not the same strength. If you're standing next to a mountain, you get, you feel that gravitational pull, not physically, but if you had a, an instrument, you could measure it. And the same thing is true next to an ice sheet. So the ocean actually feels the presence of an ice sheet, gravity, the gravity of an ice sheet. And so it tends to pile up towards the ice sheet. This, this is the ice sheet and this is the ocean. And then if the ice sheet, loses some water or ice and that turns into water overall the ocean goes up of course because you're putting more water into it but next to the ice sheet the ocean goes down because it feels less gravity and so that water slumps out which is an amazing fact and it means that in fact far away from the ice sheet you actually get an even a little bit more sea level rise because some of that water which used to be being held up next to the ice sheet is now next to you and so that's gravity. Other things include um, uh, how warm the ocean is. Warmer it is, the, the larger the volume it takes up, it expands. Another thing is ocean currents. So water flowing around actually holds itself up relative to other ones. And so you can get changes in the height of the sea that way. And also storms, of course, storm surges are a change in the sea level associated with the atmosphere changing in pressure. It actually gets lower pressure and, and water rises because of that. So there's a whole host of interesting processes which affect the sea level. It's a great question. Um, Philip Crowley has a question about temperature. 
Um, what were temperatures like during your field work in Antarctica? And further to that, you just mentioned storms. So mm. what does a storm in Antarctica look like, feel like? Is there anything comparable that any of us um, here um, would know or think about? Well, that's a good question too. So we were there in the summer, so we aren't going to ever... When we're out in our tent, we don't want to be there in the winter when the worst storms would come through. But we were out there in the summer in the warm, relatively warm temperatures. But still we were, you know, probably average of minus, minus 20 C. So that's that, you know, you're below zero Fahrenheit. Um, the coldest temperatures I've ever camped in were minus 36 Fahrenheit in Greenland. And that gets really uncomfortable when it gets that cold. Um, but for the most part, if it's sunny and you have the right clothing, you can be quite warm. And then when storms come through, the temperature actually generally goes up, but you get really strong winds and snow is picked up from the ground. It's stuck, people call it blowing snow. So 10 feet, there's a 10 foot layer of just snow driving horizontally through. So that buries all your equipment. That's the major thing with a storm. You can't work because you can't see and it's, and it's dangerous. And the next day you have to do a lot of digging because it really does just, the snow just gathers around all your equipment and buries it. And so the winds can be very strong. It's usually not too uncomfortable because you're inside your tent keep trying to keep warm. But the next day is the real pain because you'll have to dig everything out again <laughs> without damaging it. So for those of us who are in snowstorms and complain on the other continents, we, you think that we're being wimps on. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so talk about digging out. What is it like to dig out? How long does that take? And um, yeah. have you ever been in an avalanche and is it, is it similar in that respect? Or do you lose a sense of yeah. what's up and what's down? Well, no, not in the same sense as an avalanche, but I think this because it's so an avalanche is so sudden of course you know i've never been in avalanche. i've been in places where you have to uh, be careful to test for avalanches and see whether it's going to happen or not for our case it's um you really want to just uh you really just have to be very careful to keep track of where all your equipment is because you have all your stuff strewn out across the camp across the ice and you have to put flags around because if a storm comes in that will just completely be covered and it will look like everywhere else and you won't be able to see it. So you put these flags down, which are longer, like two or three meters long. And um, then you can dig out around those flags because you know that's where you put your equipment. But no, thank, I'm very pleased I can say I've never been in an avalanche. Um, so uh, that's good. Um, though I love the snow, so I can only imagine how much it's hard, but must be fun to dig yourself out. Um, so we had, Sagan had a question, um, I think Sagan said, who's seven, did you see any animals? animals? Yeah. What about the wildlife? Yeah, that's a good question. Over on, so where we were was in the middle of that huge slab of ice. So there really is no living creatures there at all, except us. And, um, but on the coast, Antarctica's got loads of life, amazing, amazing life, very um, fertile oceans, which support all sorts of different creatures. So I've, I've seen um, humpback whales and penguins and, and seals, elephant seals, and all sorts of seabirds. And I don't, yeah, that wasn't, that, I only saw that on the way to where I was doing my work and on the way back because for that two month period when we're there, you really don't see anything at all other than your own equipment and the, the waves in the surface of the, of the snow. So those things called, are called sastrugi, which is an Inuit word. And it's the, ends up being the, the scenery to look at because there's nothing else there. But, and so when we got back to, um, to South America on the way home, we suddenly saw grass and everything was so green. It was amazing like to see for the first time in all that time. So, so but no, almost no creatures out where we were. So quite amazing. Wow. Eve, who's nine, wants to know how long did it take you to get there? Yeah, about, about six days, I think it was. I mean, you know, so, five or six days. So we, what I flew from London to Madrid to Santiago in Chile, 
and then to Punta Arenas, which is also in Chile on the very bottom end of South America. And then we stayed there for three days waiting for the weather to be good. And then we flew across the ocean to Antarctica, across the Drake Passage to Antarctica. And um, so that got me to Antarctica. But to get to where all those pictures were from, that took another two weeks because I had to do a lot of work and testing of my equipment. And then we took three more days of travel in those small planes. So by the time you get there, yes, three weeks of three weeks of travel, really. <laughs> um, Timothy Donnelly asks, it looks as if East Antarctica wasn't melting or losing mass. Is that correct? And if so, why is that? Oh, yeah, that's true. That's correct. Um, there are lots of reasons why it hasn't l lost mass so much. And one of them is that as the atmosphere warms, you actually get more snowfall. The, the air can actually hold more moisture. So you get more snowfall and ice sheets change. They get bigger and smaller because it's a balance between ice going into the ocean and ice coming in from snowfall. So if you turn on the faucet more, you get more coming in, you get the bathtub fills up. So that's what the, that is happening in East Antarctica now. And the other reason is that the ocean, which is trying to melt away at the sides of other places, East Ant other places in Antarctica, it's actually not doing that for the most part in East Antarctica, nearly as much. So most of the melting and the, and the loss is happening in West Antarctica, not East Antarctica. Wow. So Nova, who's 10, wants to know what happens when two icebergs collide? Yeah, that's a good question. I think there would probably, um, there would probably be a lot of, there would be probably a whole bunch of waves which get formed and there'd be some cracking and then they would probably um, travel along together for a while and then break apart later. And sometimes you can get things like uh, a glacier which is poking out into the ocean. They're called ice tongues. And they're a little floating bit of ice, not an iceberg yet, but it's, it's still attached to the ice sheet. So it's still, it's not an iceberg, but it's poking out. And then an iceberg comes along and it's really big iceberg with a lot of momentum and it can knock into the ice tongue and then break it off. And these things are hundreds, you know, these are miles and miles long. An iceberg can come along and crack it off the ocean, off the ice sheet. And then that becomes an iceberg. So um, almost what you're talking about there. Wow. Um, so Griselda, who's six and in Chicago, what happens if your tent gets buried in the snow? That, that's a great question. I, it does. It's actually, that's good. That's a good thing if it gets buried because it actually makes it safer. The, the picture I could have show, I could show you another picture, but there's this on the side of the tent. It's this, there's these big flat bits of tent, which go out across the surface and you put all your equipment on the side and then you bury it in snow to, to keep it down because the wind's trying to, to blow it away. So the more snow around the edge of the tent, the better in some ways. It's not good for when you want to move because you have to dig the thing out. But overall, it's a good thing if it gets buried. What you don't want is for the snow to be whipped away and then you to be left on the surface because then the tent could blow away and then that would be really serious. <laughs> That would be very serious. Yeah. It, it's interesting, Johnny, because previously in one of our Columbia at Home webinars, we had an engineering alum and professor, Mike Massimino, who's an astronaut, oh, wow. Wow. talk about his preparation and what you need to be prepared for. Um, what about the training that you had to prepare for? Um, what did you do? I, I'm sure you're not digging um, here um, <laughs> very often, and it's obviously a very different experience when it's freezing cold, and um, that's from George, who's age eleven. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we got training for first aid, and we got training for how to do things like setting up ropes if you fall down, you know, if you if you fall down a hole in the ice or something like that. But physical training, no, we didn't do that, and it's. It's, it's really physically hard. I think you just have to, it's, it's something you have to get used to because you're there for two months. It's not something which you have to just endure for a week and then go. You have to really just make it a lifestyle. 
So we didn't do any training and maybe we sh maybe I should have done. What I did was get, um, you know, practiced in using the radar. And that was a really hard thing. One thing was the way we did it was I was the scientist on the trip. So I had to know about the radar and know about where to do the measurements and stuff. And the other person was a field expert. So he was in charge of safety and um, was much physic more physically fit than I am. <laughs> so it was that it was that was the separation. He was the field guy, the you know, safety person, and I was the scientist. And that was a useful separation to have because when you're making decisions, it's really good to have that separation. Um, what is your favorite glacier and why? And this is from Rebecca Lato and Will Fleming. Rebecca Lato. Okay. Um, yeah, that's that's a great question. It's got to be one I've actually been to. Um, what's my favorite glacier? I don't know if I, I don't think I, I don't think I can commit to a favorite one at the moment. But but maybe some of the, the most beautiful places I've been to in Alaska, um, the Gilkey Glacier in Alaska, where um, yeah, that's one of the most stunning places in the world. Of course, Antarctica is full of amazing glaciers, but when, it's not quite the same as when you're there. The scenery is not quite the same as somewhere like Alaska, where there are these beautiful mountains in the set in the background. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Pippa from South Carolina, who's six, wants to know, were you ever on a floating iceberg? No, not on a floating iceberg, no. And, but people, you can, they are very big and you can land planes on them if you want to. We were actually on a floating bit of the ice. So this gives me a good chance to talk about the ice sheet again. So the, the ice sheet is mostly on the ground, but where it flows out towards the ocean, it gets thin enough that it actually floats on the ocean. It's like a future iceberg. It's still attached to the, the ice sheet, but it's still afloat. So we spent a lot of time on that. And that is a very strange feeling to be on this thing, which looks exactly the same as the stuff which you know was on the ground, but, it, but you know from all the data that it's 300 meters thick and then there's 200 meters of water beneath you. So it, but it looks exactly the same. It's very strange. And it would look exactly the same if you were on a huge iceberg as well, cra crazily. And do you feel like you're moving? No, or not at all. Not at all. No, not at all. But overnight, you would have, we, when we calculated it, of course, overnight, you might have moved 150 meters. So 500 feet. But uh, that's just overnight. But you just don't feel it. And I just, that is a strange feeling, I think. Well, strange knowledge to have. It didn't feel like anything. <laughs> but you weren't in the same place. But then there's no trees or landmarks no. that you can say, oh, wow, I moved. No, exactly. You're swimming in the ocean and there's a tide and all of a sudden you realize that that lifeguard stand is way down the beach, right? You have no sense yeah. of where you are. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good analogy, yeah. What about the sea animals? Does the melting ice affect them? Yeah, I think it does, actually. It does because um, sea animals, they depend on the chemistry of the ocean in a lot of, in a lot of ways because the little tiny plants, the little plankton, the little algae and plankton, all rely on things like iron coming off the continents. So iron is dissolved in the ocean, believe it or not, in different concentrations. And ice sheets um, supply things like that to the ocean. So if those ice sheets either start supplying more because they're melting faster, or they shrink so much that they're not supplying that, that will affect the um, ecosystems because it will change the chemistry of the ocean and that will change how those algae and plankton feed and that actually feeds all the way back up to the, the largest animals in the planet because because of the food webs are so complicated and so connected. How deep is the ice in Antarctica compared to the North Pole? I've read that there's land underneath the ice in Antarctica but not in the North Pole. Yeah that's okay that's a good thing to clear up so the in the North Pole, there's actually just an ocean, and, and when it freezes over, and you, you know, almost all the time there's ice there, um, it's the surface of the ocean freezing. It's a few meters thick, it's called sea ice because it's just the surface of the ice freezing because it gets cold. But a little bit south from that, there is this big island called Greenland, which is the same thing as the thing I was talking about. It is an ice sheet, there's rock underneath that. So when people talk about the North Pole, yeah that's not covered in an ice sheet and there's water down there, but there is still a huge ice sheet up there. It's just slightly off the North Pole. And so Greenland, that, that's got 
um, 3,000 meters of ice, so still very thick. And then East Antarctica, which is the, is two and two and a half miles thick, so a little bit thicker. It's actually 4,000 something meters thick. So it's a little bit thicker, but it's not. It's much wider down in Antarctica. There's much more ice there, but it's only a little bit thicker. Wow. Okay. How do you communicate with the base? Yeah, you communicate with the with the radio and. Uh, in some of those pictures you might have seen you probably didn't but there was a wire coming out of the top of the tent going off a few, like 10 feet in both directions and it's a, a long wave radio and you it's very old-fashioned <laughs> system and you have a daily um, connect daily phone call daily radio message with the base and they ask you how you're doing and they just make sure you're safe and if you didn't message in with them then they would start getting nervous and then if you and then they would think about sending someone to come and find out where you are <laughs> and find out why aren't you phoning in. There's, so there's that, that's the normal way. And then there's also a, a satellite phone, which um, you can phone. It's like a, a large cell phone and you can just use it like a cell phone, but it's very expensive. So the radio is free. So people get prefer you to use the radio. <laughs> So um, we have Claire, who's 19, from Southern California. Obviously, we were able to see the exciting part of your research field work. But what was involved in analyzing your work? Physics, yeah. topography, statistics. How did, you dedu how did you deduce that the ice sheet was once smaller than it was before? Yeah, that's a, that's a huge question because, of course, it is much more of our time is sat in front of the computer and talking with each other, discussing um, our findings and trying to work out what on earth all this means because of these features were kind of confusing at first. And what it involves is some physics, some geophysics, which, which you might, is what you might call um, the process of looking at that data and working out exactly how all those features line up together. And that, that use special software for that. And that's a lot, a lot of work too and then other people came in and they did some chemistry so they looked at some s samples from the ice sheet and they and they and that involves running um, analyses of sediment samples in a lab and then there's some other people who came in and did computer simulations and that was so that really is writing a computer program to describe the ice sheet and how it changes and running simulations and to see uh, what we think happened in the past. So th that's the practicalities of what ends up happening. And then a huge amount of thinking and writing and iterating. So you write something and someone says, I don't really see what you mean. And can you explain this? And then you, you write it again and they think, and then they write some stuff and it's very iterative if that's not too much of a jargony word, but very, you know, repeat, you know, repeat this over and over again. So that's a huge amount of science is discussing and thinking about, no, I, I, I guess that idea doesn't make sense. Yeah, you're right. Let's go back to the drawing board and like that and over and over again. So that's, that's the practicality. But do you actually want to know how it, <laughs> do we have time to go into how we actually, in this case, decided on that? <laughs> yeah, if you, we have a couple of minutes, go ahead. Yeah, in, that, in this case, so those features, um, we found the best ex explanation for them were they were actually um, fractures, which only form in the ice when the ice is being stretched very quickly. And we came up with this scenario which explained how those fractures could be there in this ice, which is moving very slowly now, even though fractures form when the ice goes very quickly. And it involved the ice sheet having um, been afloat in that location and then later um, the ice regrounded on the seafloor. So that was on our side of the ice sheet. That actually agreed with the interpretation of some other data on the other side of the ice sheet. And then that German team, which I talked about with the computer models, they came in and did simulations and it all fitted together very nicely. Um, and, the, and the final answer was that the ice sheet could have been smaller than it is today. And that would explain all our observations. So that was really nice how that all came together. It must be nice when it all comes together. Yeah, yeah. So, Plenty of times it doesn't, so. Yeah, so one last question from Camilla, for, who's 11 from Peru. I love how we're all over the world here. Um, she would like to know how many hours of daylight you had while there in the summertime. Yeah. Well, first of all, just say how I was in Peru last summer with our graduate students, and it's the most beautiful country in the world. Absolutely amazing. I would love to go back there. Um, and we saw some beautiful glaciers as well. 
So the short answer is 24 hours. We were just, it was 24 hours sunlight. It, the sun would never, it would just rotate around at about this height and it would just rotate around like this. And it would get a little bit colder at night, but not really that much. So we wow. were far enough south to be 24 hours sunlight. Wow, that must have been difficult to sleep at times. Yeah, yeah. Well, you just the first night and then you get tired enough that you'd sleep. <laughs> well, Johnny, thank you so much. I mean, we have more questions. Thank you everyone for submitting them. Um, certainly we will forward them to Johnny. And for all of you, we have our Lamont Doherty campus um, in New York. And obviously it is not open to the public now, but they do have open houses. So hopefully as we get through this pandemic, you will have the opportunity, whether you're in the New York area, whether you come to New York, um, certainly let us know and visit. Um, it certainly is a spectacular place. And we're just so grateful, Johnny, for you participating today. Thank you. And for all the work that you do, you. helping to make sure that um, the effects of climate change are as minimal as possible. Um, you're certainly doing some really important work um, at this time. Thanks. Our, our next event will be navigating a job search in a difficult market with four members of the Columbia Career Coaches Network. It will be on July 22nd at 7 p.m. Eastern. Please visit alumni.columbia.edu to register. And once again, thank you everyone for participating. Um, we will have this online so you can share. Um, if, I know some people said that they didn't have all their family participating and had some grandchildren. You'll be able to share it and watch it again. Thank you everyone. Stay healthy and safe and see you at a next Columbia at home. Bye. Absolutely.